I want to introduce Randy Claremont. He um, is the Lake Huron Basin Coordinator, and um, which is funny because he's based out of, you know, Odin Hatchery, which is on the wrong side of the state. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he is an expert in all of this kind of stuff and really, you know, loves the salmon program and salmon in the classroom. And he's a great speaker for this. So he actually spoke to us um, kind of a similar talk at our salmon summit I told you guys about, um, what was it, two winters ago. And, uh, you know, hope to bring him back in the future when we can actually do those salmon summits again. But what we normally do at workshops, because we normally have them um, geographically based. So we offer a workshop at the Wolf Lake Hatchery in Kalamazoo. We offer one in the Detroit area, um, one in Cadillac, and then one in the UP. And I have a biologist that's more familiar with that area and the associated Great Lake come and chat about ecosystems and changes and salmon and all of those bits and pieces. Um, and of course, you guys are from everywhere today and all the things all the time. So uh, we shifted gears a little bit and had Randy come in instead of those individual biologists, we're having him kind of give a state of the state of salmon for the whole state. So that's where Randy comes in. I'll let him tell you more about his job and career and all that good stuff. So go ahead, Randy. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. I'm really glad to be here. Thanks, everybody, for uh joining us and what you do in Salmon in the Classroom. I think it's just a phenomenal program. Um, very useful to myself as a fisheries manager to help people understand um, and connect to this really important program. So as Tracy mentioned, I'm, I, I've traditionally worked out of the Odin State Fish Hatchery. Um, and believe it or not, I, we, I actually still, even though I'm on the west side of the state, work in the Lake Huron watershed. So there's this small little ridge by Petoskey State Park that separates out Lake Michigan from Crooked, Pickerel, Burt, Mullet Lake that all drain out to Lake Huron. And that's why that hatchery is in my watershed, part of the management. Um, but it's always an interesting tidbit is um, to let people know, even though you're a stone throw from Lake Michigan, it's um, uh, you're, you're actually in the Lake Huron watershed. When you look at salmon issues, you know, these are really Great Lakes issues and um, the salmon program has come a long way. And I know Tracy went over some of the history and I'll speak a little bit to that, but I really want to get at kind of where we're at in the state of management. And some of this might be a little philosophical. Some of it might be uh, uh, showing you a little bit of the challenges of the salmon program, but hopefully it might spark some questions you might have or um, uh, at least put in, frame it in a bigger context. To give you a little bit of background about myself, I grew up in Frankenmuth in the Thumb. Um, and I can remember as a kid, as a, as a youth, the, the small tributaries flowing into the Cass River were, were so full of alewives, you know, because there were no salmon to control them and they were invasive, that you could literally, it, it, was, it, it was like the whole river was silver. And then a couple years later, Here's 30 pounds Chinook coming in these small little tributaries. And those are my first, some of my first memories of fisheries, you know, in the Cass River watershed there. Um, so I grew up in Frankenmuth. I went to Michigan State University, got a degree in fish and wildlife management. And then I did a master's degree in aquatic ecology at the University of Illinois. At the same time, the uh, invasion, uh, invasive carps were coming in the Mississippi River. And I got my first job with the USGS working on the river, looking at impacts of navigation. And we kept finding these small silver fish that in May were a couple inches and by August were six pounds. And we're what the what in the world are these? You know, so that was uh, uh, um, quite an experience. And then I came back to Michigan to actually work with a Native American tribe, Little Travers Bay Bands of Adawa Indians uh, before I I uh, worked there for five years, helping them set up a fisheries program, came back to the state um, as a DNR research biologist on Lake Michigan. You'll see a lot of my uh, slides today are going to use Lake Michigan as an example because I think it tells the salmon story very well um, before I moved to Lake Huron as a manager. So um, I, I could say I've worked for state, federal and tribal agencies. Um, and you know, gives me a un unique perspective in terms of uh, managing fisheries. So with that, I'm going to jump into the presentation. And, and again, hopefully this gives you some insight. So I'm going to share my screen. And um, if you don't see the presentation, Tracy, let me know. But um, my title slide is just um, uh, a kind of a kickoff to the, it's my uh, uh, picture of me standing with Howard Tanner and the MUCC 
headquarters. If you don't know Howard Tanner, um, he's kind of uh, him and Wayne Toady have been noted as the um, uh, the really the, the the two people that um, conceptualized and implemented the introduction of Pacific salmon in the Great Lakes. So um, we have had uh, not only the joy of meeting Howard, but talking to him at length and um, uh, reading his book and hearing his perspective in terms of this program. Um, the the salmon program, as you might well know, is a is a huge economic driver. It is a um, uh, substantial fishery for Michigan. Creates generates a lot of effort, and uh, and that effort I'll put in perspective. I'm not going to talk a lot about Lake Huron, but when the salmon crashed in Lake Huron in the early 2000s, 2004 in particular, we lo we went from six million angler hours a year in Lake Huron down to 2 million and we haven't recovered. So we lost 4 million angler hours per year in Lake Huron just because of the collapse of the Chinook salmon fishery. So um, it's a very critical fishery and, and one that um, is is probably, or I, I could say argumentatively, and I'll show you some examples, the most intense, intensively managed fishery in North America. Um, and you know, I, every time I look at the salmon fishery from both the current management and um, historically, you know, what, how it, it came to be in the Great Lakes, I mean, it puts it on the top five, you know, fisheries, freshwater fisheries management issues in the world. It really does. It's been referenced that way. I, I'm not just saying it. But I think the three questions that we might want to try to talk about today is, you know, did we really need to introduce Pacific salmon in the Great Lakes? Has it been a successful program? And then maybe what a lot of you might be wondering, is it sustainable? Because I know after salmon um, declines in both Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, people have been asking that question, why are we stock, continuing to stock um, uh, anadromous, you know, Pacific salmon into a freshwater Great Lake? Why do we need to do that for management? So hopefully get into those those type of questions. I, I'm not going to go into a lot of the history, but I will tell you there's a um, I, I draft or I, I um, authored a book chapter in the Great Lakes Fisheries Policy and Management Second Edition that describes in length a lot of, from a technical side the introduction of Pacific salmon and why we need it. The idea of these different periods through time, um, you know, native species dominating the Great Lakes, um, the transitional that really included you know, European development and development, a, a lot, especially along the Great Lakes shoreline, um, massive deforestation, destruction to water quality, and then moving into this period of high invasive species impacts after the sea lamprey invaded the Great Lakes and after um, uh, continued invasions in, in terms of this entire ecosystem. Uh, I've argued since this that we're really entering a new era and um, yet to be defined, but it's one that gets at the sustainability issue that, that um, I think is really important. Looking historically, you know, again, I know that Tracy went over this, but, you know, here's a little bit of that food pyramid approach. And, and I like to use these slides because it referenced what our fisheries managers, um, how they communicated back in the 60s. Um, the need for introducing coho salmon in 1966 in Lake Michigan, the first specific salmon introduction, followed by Chinook in 1967. Um, it really, you know, we had a stable food web, but then it was completely disrupted, both with uh, sea lamprey invasion, but also unregulated fishing that once the sea lamprey um, came in, the, the fishing pressure was just too much for the food web to handle. And then obviously an explosion of invasive uh, prey fishes, alewife and rainbow smelt, no, no natural controls or feedback in the system. Um, you've all seen sea lamprey. I mean, I think it's a really good example and one that um, resonates across ecosystems is one invader can be one too many if it's the right invader, if it and, and it can restructure an entire ecosystem and food web, and we saw that with the, them decimating the the predators on the uh, um, uh, the la the native predator, the lake trout, and leading to an ecosystem basically with a middle out dynamic and no top predator control. 
Um, as is referenced, the you know the this explosion of alewives and this uh, dis highly disturbed food web. There was very strong both biological and social support. As Howard Tanner would say, you know, he was given a pass to basically do whatever he could do to restore this ecosystem and bring back the fishery and a better balance. Um, you know, here's some pictures just showing some of those early introductions of coho from the plat and then the returns that next year. And um, I like this quote because he said, uh, not only did it catch on, and have you seen the, some of the historic pictures of how that fishery was just on fire and, and boats lined up. And, uh, but he said, you know, the, not only did the towns run out of gasoline, but he said, then the worst thing happened, they all ran out of beer. So, I mean, it was a, it was a response for the fishery that still resonates um, today. But as we look at this, um, this history of the Great Lakes salmon, I have to kind of bring you back to the technical side just for a moment. And this idea of this food web or food pyramid being structured and the disruption that you saw, um, it is important to note how the introduction of Pacific salmon was at an ecosystem level, you know, the scale of the Great Lakes, one of the biggest bio manipulation um, actions, management actions taken to restore a healthy food web and fishery. We have done this in other ecosystems and um, most of the time it either isn't successful or is even worse than the, 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 um, the current state. So, you know, this is what could have happened in the Great Lakes. Um, I use some exist uh, some examples of ecosystem bio manipulation, and I use these because I think they're good examples with with your Sam in the classroom program, you know, to talk to students about how an ecosystem functions and how much control we have. But you know, if you look at the Australian um, uh, uh, cane beetle, it was an invasive species that was devastating their sugar cane. They introduced the cane toad, which was the native predator in, in that um, uh, where the cane beetle was originated from. They introduced it into Australia to try to control this invasive beetle. And um, it went horribly wrong because the beetles simply changed the distribution on the sugar cane, making them unaccessible to the cane toads. The toads ate everything else. There's a lot of ground birds in Australia um, and they are highly toxic so there, no predators could eat the cane toad and you can see the size of the one the gentleman's holding there um, completely started to revamp their ecosystems and they made one problem uh, much worse by the introduction of the predator. Likewise if you've ever been familiar with the Nile perch introduction into Lake Vic uh, Victoria in Africa um, this was another experiment that would ex that went very wrong in terms of trying to e exert some top level control on an ecosystem. The Nile perch was not native. It consumed 99% of the biomass, driving several native cichlids to um, uh, extinction. Um, it ate across food web or, or trophic levels, so it didn't just prey on um, other fish species that started eating, eating prawns, perch, uh, um, shrimp-like species. So because it ate across the different trophic levels, it completely disrupted the food web to the point where the only thing left in Lake Victoria was Nile perch. And then Nile perch started consuming other Nile perch. And then it was caught on by uh, the locals as the perch was um, cannibalistic and then people didn't want to eat them and it was just a bad experiment that really was disruptive. And if you look at one of the issues we're facing right now in the US, the grass carp, I would put it in the same category. Um, it was brought here intentionally uh, to control vegetation in the uh, aquaculture setting and now look at the threat it's posing in the Great Lakes in terms of these evasive carps and what they could potentially do. So think about those examples with the salmon program and um, this could have gone horribly wrong. Um, some might argue, I'm gonna show you Chinook salmon stocking now um, across the Great Lakes, starting in, in 1967. For each of the lakes, we experienced this exponential increase in stocking. 
And we did this as, as we started exerting control and seeing those fish come back. But now look at where we're at. We're on a continued exponential decline in Chinook salmon stocking across all of the Great Lakes. And some might argue this experiment has run its course. It's not sustainable. Why are we doing this? And I know um, teachers in the past that have done salmon in the classroom have circled back to me and other biologists and saying, we're getting these questions about, is this, you know, why are we rearing salmon when there's no food for them in the lakes? And hopefully uh, the next series of slides will show you will get at why salmon are still an important um, predator in our fish communities, and I, but how we have to change our view in this new era of managing them. Um, when I reference back to them being the most intensively managed species, I'm going to you know, show you some pictures here of uh, every Chinook salmon being stocked, running through automated trailers, mass marked with a micro tag that um, if somebody catches a Chinook salmon with an adipose fin clip, they can turn it into us. And I can tell you who fed that fish in the hatchery. Um, to estimating natural reproduction, recruitment to the fishery, growth rates, age composition, um, to large vessel survey programs that estimate how much food availability and production of prey fish is available in the lakes to uh, feed the salmon that are out there, including sonars and hydroacoustics and high tech, you know, some of the high tech fishery stuff that's, that exists in North America to midwater trawls and trawls that are controlled by electronics. So we know what depth, what temperature and how they're fishing. Well, Part of this assessment program to understand salmon, the, uh, um, uh, our management of salmon in the Great Lakes came out of this idea that um, it was a huge biomanipulation and we better assess the impacts. I tell uh, a lot of people when I speak to them about uh, fisheries management that it's to some extent, there's some very basic principles. And one of them, them is if dead fish are showing up on the shore, uh, you got a problem. And we, you know, as we talked about with uh, alewife washing up at the beaches, we have a problem in the salmon to some extent. You know, we can, I can show you data right now that the more fish that we stocked, the more that were harvested, and the less alewife die offs were there. And this is just a graph showing Lake Michigan data now as the example. Um, and this is a fisheries management dream and nightmare, if you will. In other words, if you put fish in, um, the, the white bars, three, four years later, they'll show up in the fishery. If you put more in, people will catch more and you're bringing more balance. And so this relationship, you know, was probably a good time for fisheries managers because, you know, it, it was a direct one to one. You put more fish in, you get more fish out. But then the next thing you know, we, we had a series of uncoordinated stocking across the Great Lakes or across Lake Michigan because dead salmon started washing up on the beaches. And a lot of you may not be familiar with the uh, salmon crash in the mid 1980s, but um, look at the harvest of the red decline, even though in the white bar, we were at record high stocking levels. This era led to this um, understanding that we don't have control over these Great Lakes systems, that yes, we went through a period of the more, more fish you put in, the more you get out, but now look, we increased stocking even more. Actually, in that year, that was a record high. Um, one state agency decided to cut stocking and the other decided to increase stocking. And we didn't even have a coordinated management to know where to go. Um, and the, the harvest continued to decline as dead salmon washed up on the beaches. This was what drove the need for assessment data and understanding the role that Pacific salmon played in the ecosystem. Since then, you can see the red is the, the harvest coming back up and our stocking levels coming back down and highly coordinated management actions um, that led to very distinct decisions in um, uh, cutting stocking. So I, I'll, I'll kind of just label this initial period as social expectations building in terms of what people can get out of the fishery and um, there was so much distrust after the salmon crash in the mid-1980s. They didn't believe we were stocking the fish anymore. We, we had reports of anglers showing up in their cars at our, at our fish hatcheries, wanting to see the fish being loaded into the hatchery trucks and then follow those trucks to the shoreline 
to prove that we were actually putting the fish in. They just couldn't believe it. Um, and since then, you know, that salmon crash, we lost a lot of public trust. We've had to rebuild that and get into this bringing stakeholders into the management and understanding that it's more complicated than just you stock salmon. And I'm going to break that down and, and where we're at in this new dynamic. Um, so let me just show you the stocking graph in another light. So this is the same data. Here's like Michigan salmon stocking over the course of the last uh, you know, 50 years. Um, and to show you part of the reason why we've had to decrease our stocking over time. Um, if you look at some of these coordinated stocking cuts, this was really driven by an understanding that natural recruitment here, um, here is represented in this red line, was um, building to the point where the lake was producing as many wild fish as we were stocking. And um, if you look at the, especially the recent years, not only were they producing as many or more, they are doing so on the scale of six to eight million wild salmon, Chinook salmon produced in a given year in Lake Michigan. You know, that, that was unprecedented. And who would have thought introducing a landlocked, you know, anadromous Pacific salmon, Pacific Ocean fish like this could naturalize to the point where they were producing uh, upwards of uh, five to seven million wild smolts. Um, the salmon fishery that crashed in Lake Huron, a lot of people at the time were saying Lake Michigan is going to crash too. And by the way, we haven't yet to see a full recovery of the salmon populations in Lake Huron after that 2004 crash. Um, but as you can see in this last year, this data in 2012, we, we cut again to our record low um, Shook salmon stocking. We went in 2012 back to um, 1972 stocking levels. So let that sink in for a second. So, you know, we were almost back to the start of not stocking salmon in Lake Michigan. At the same year we did that, if people remember the water levels in Lake Michigan or in the Great Lakes in 2011, we were at record low levels. We were seeing shores exposed, um, beaches extended out, uh, rivers that were basically becoming disconnected or very low flows to the Great Lakes. Um, and in that year that the salmon came back, um, the natural recruits were up at around 6 million produce a year. The salmon couldn't get into their spawning habitats in, the, in Michigan rivers. We dropped from 6 million to 1 million. So I could say that the state agencies coordinated a stocking reduction that saved the salmon populations in Lake Michigan, but it was really the drop in wild recruitment that masks, you know, that really was at a scale of 5 million fish rather than our 2 million our, uh, stocking cut that really drove the, the, the dynamics in the lake. And I'll, and I'll kind of talk through that um, a little bit more here. So total recruitment dropped in a way that allowed um, a recovery in the food web that's still being played out in Lake Michigan salmon and the prey dynamics today. So, um, so what was happening with the alive prey? You know, we have very good model data to show that really the salmon introduction causes extremely high abundance of alewife and other other pelagic prey fishes to decrease, and that really then led to Chinook salmon populations being too high, and then their populations crashing. There was a slight recovery after this, but what you'll notice is, is it wasn't as high as you might expect in a predator prey dynamic. And some might ask, well, why did that slight increase lead to such a high level of salmon wild recruitment and biomass? Um, and, and that's a really good question to also think about that I'll get into. But if you look at this, um, it's really part of it is what's now causing the second decline is not just salmon biomass. So um, the answer to both of these, why didn't that peak, the second peak go higher, and why is the alewife populations continue to decline, really is best represented by the introduction now of zebra quagga mussels, which I will argue on a scale of the Great Lakes is almost equal to the invasion of sea lamprey in the 1960s. This is best demonstrated by a lake of uh, a, a cup of lake water. And if you if you take a couple lake water, it's Michigan Sea Grant pictures that they're very good at describing this. You drop in a couple mussels. A mussel can each mussel can filter a liter of, of lake water in a day. Put a few into a, a cup, 
run a timer. Here's 43 seconds later, you can already see a difference. Run it for three minutes, start to get clear, clear, clear. By eight minutes, you have almost crystal clear water. And, you know, this is just an example of what's happening as mussels now colonize the lake bed from shore to shore. Um, zebra and quagga mussels, but mostly quaggas now we're going deep. It's really restructured these entire food webs. Um, notice, and I'll get to this a little bit, that clear water as a predator, they can now see the prey much more than when they were when the water was was turbid. So what we found is the reason why that second peak in alewife populations didn't come back up very high was that they didn't need to because the predators had their efficiency to eat their alewives went up so high because they could see them better. At the same time, this was happening. The nutrients coming into the lake, which really didn't change a, a large amount, were being filtered heavily by the dry synods, leading to fewer prey fish or, or fewer uh, plankton and zooplankton and small food for prey fish. Um, you know, we saw this in the, the benthic invertebrates in particular, a species called the diapria, a deep water uh, benthic amphipod. Their populations nearly collapsed from all of the upper Great Lakes. Um, very huge reductions in alewife and therefore fewer salmon. So the salmon could see the alewife better. The alewife were being squeezed by the bottom and then quickly those prey populations I, and to just again re reference like here on this happened in a matter of four years. Um, this the salmon saw the alewife, the alewife couldn't reproduce, and uh, four years later it was over. <clears throat> so um, as we talk through this, I, I kind of want to go through from both a science and a social standpoint, you know how we've tried to manage this. I'm going to go ahead and just put all of these up here and kind of talk through them. And, and what I'm showing you is, from a science standpoint, a very intensive way to try to model this predator-prey dynamic, and then how we interacted those models. So these, these are just the names of the models. And then um, on the yellow side is how we attempted to communicate those models to our stakeholders. All these changes were happening. The first model was a model to try to attempt to connect salmon with the prey and they called it the connect model and it was a reactive model to the Chinook population crash in the mid 1980s. Needless to say um, it didn't go over very well in terms of yes it helped us understand it but but it wasn't really resonating with stakeholders because um, it was a period of low trust. Then the we had the Chinook salmon population models in the 1990s with basically no involvement from stakeholders. That transitioned into um, the first kind of interactive model called Salmon in Cold Oligotrophic Lakes 1 or Skull 1 in the 1990s that had with it an educational component called the 10 red flags. And the 10 red flags really meant to take indicators from that modeling process to communicate to stakeholders when we're seeing problems with managing salmon and their prey and their dynamics in Lake Michigan. Um, and that started to resonate, connecting a technical model with changes in, in, in salmon. The second Connect model was revised with a series of workshops in the mid 1990s that really started building this idea that you have to have both the technical side with all of this data and the stakeholder input. So those led to a new series of both predator and prey models in the Skull 2 following the mid 1990s and a revision of this red flags analysis. Um, that was followed by two very comprehensive decision analyses done by Michigan State University that basically takes model development with stakeholders in the room to develop options. And the best way I, I, I would communicate this is the stakeholders actually get to kind of narrow down different management actions like what would happen if we doubled stocking? What would happen if we decreased stocking? And then the decision analysis will run probability scenarios to say, well, if you double stocking, you have um, a 200% risk of crashing the fishery in five years. And so these decision analysis were not only stakeholder involved, but in the end were actually, the ownership was put in the hands of the stakeholders. So from a, from a 
what at a researcher at the time, uh, this was extremely exciting and needed as these muscles were causing this change in the food web. Um, this is what that, that predator prey model looked like. Here's a Chinook alewife component of it. Um, from a technical standpoint, there's a lot of basis for what a predator prey ratio model like this would look like. So you've got our stocking lever, lever and you have some indication of a predator prey dynamic that feeds back into how many fish we should stock where the, the stakeholders have already developed options that they want to us to pull the lever or not pull the lever. To give you an idea what this looks like from a, a you know ecosystem or a predator prey dynamic, you know, here the lynx and the hare is a traditional example. When the predator goes up, the the prey, they drive the prey populations down, the prey then crashes, the predators go up, uh, or, the, um, or the predators crash, and it's this oscillation between predator and prey that really, if you took a ratio of that, you could tell where you were at, and it wasn't, uh, it's, it's based on the absolute biomass of both predator and prey, but it gives you a quick understanding of, of whether or not you're in a, in a uh, problem area in terms of the dynamic. So this was applied to the Chinook salmon uh, biomass for Lake Michigan. That's this graph right here. Here's a model biomass of Chinook salmon over time relative to the, what you've already seen, which is the modeled biomass of alewife over time into a ratio. What's really unique about this ratio uh, um, that came out of the, the decision analysis is the idea that if you, um, if you implement those, Here's, here's the, um, the first run of a predator-prey um, ratio over time. And you have a target at 0 0.05 or let's say 5% and, uh, and this high threshold of 0.1 or 10% um, that it gives you an idea of where you want to manage. So where did these targets, these limits come from? This ties directly back to the idea of a food pyramid. And if you, you know, lead people into education on food pyramids and nutrient transfer, and doesn't matter if it's a terrestrial ecosystem or a aquatic e ecosystem, well, the common rule is you can only move up 10% of the biomass as you go up a trophic level. You need 90% of that biomass below it to sustain a, a predator. And that 10% rule for snook salmon as an upper threshold or that 5% target is based on that food pyramid dynamic. So here now we have an easy way of communicating to stakeholders where we're at in this predator-prey ratio. It accounts for all of this data in a very simplistic format. And now we can get into linking those to the stakeholders levers in which how they want this managed fishery where what lever we should pull for stocking so i'm just going to show you this quickly because i think it was really exciting they developed basic stocking levels here's how many chinook salmon you should you should stock based on where you were at in the predator prey ratio um if the ppr was exceeding this 10 percent in, in 2012, then we're going to move to level three and the stakeholders said absolutely we developed the options um, this 10% has a biological basis. So in 2012, that's what led to that stocking lever or that stocking reduction I showed you earlier. Now remember, wild recruitment also dropped. So this worked in the food web dynamic um, from a large, larger scale, not just because we, we reduced stocking. But then the biomasses of alewife continue to decline because of the impacts of mussels. But the stakeholders said, okay, even though this level three is a 50% reduction in Chinook salmon stocking, if the PPR continues to be high, we will go or agree to go to level four, which is the lowest level of Chinook salmon includes an 80% reduction from where we were at, at the point this, this PPR was developed. So we exceeded that in 2015. Therefore, when we when managers went to pull the lever, which a lot, you look in terms of our salmon management, you think this is phenomenal. The stakeholders are on board. The, it's been broken down in a very simplistic way. Here's the, the predator uh, prey ratio. We're at an all time high um, uh, in, in this la in 2015. So we're going to pull the lever and go to level four. Um, so this should all work. Well, you, what you should know is that um, 
when we try to manage things, we try to include both biological, social, and political. And if we do, we will find a sweet spot in our management. And some might ask, well, has this been applied successfully to what has happened to salmon management in the Great Lakes? And if it was, I don't think we would have saw, uh, observed after 2015 what we've seen in some of the Great Lakes. Um, and I think Tracy even referenced some of this in her presentation. Some of the pushback to that stocking cut in 2015 was, was unprecedented. We had legislators going to governors saying, we need to take the management of salmon out of the state agency's hands and we need to, here's how many fish we should stock. It led to such things as the Dead Salmon Society in Wisconsin, the Great Lakes Salmon Initiative in Michigan, or GLSI, um, new stakeholder groups with highly polarized stakeholders and strongly connected legislators. Credibility of biologists and surveys were attacked continually. Uh, political uh, power is applied and decisions were altered. Um, and then you might ask, well, why did this happen and what did we learn from this? And how do we go through such a very charged process trying to involve um, uh, complex models, stakeholder involvement, and then it all pushed back in, in, when we tried to actually implement these decisions. At the same time this was happening, um, I had correspondence with high level biologists and policymakers in um, our professional publications called Fisheries debating whether or not salmon was even sustainable in the Great Lakes and whether managers were wrong for pursuing their goals for stocking Pacific salmon. So if you ever want to read some very charged technical arguments. So this was, these debates were occurring um, across multiple scales in terms of are salmon really sustainable in the Great Lakes? Um, what I can say that we learned from this is that um, we really have a complex system and if you look at the new predator prey dynamic, um, it's, you know, read some stuff on cats and their roles in ecosystems. You know, the predator prey dynamic is, is extremely complicated in managing uh, systems today. Likewise, communication is happening at a very high, highly charged, rapid rate, and um, it's changed our way that we've interacted with stakeholders and, and had to communicate, involve them. And likewise, um, uh, these decision rules and apply to management, um, we need to continue to involve stakeholders at an extremely high level and have them involved in this direction as we move forward. Um, so I think we're doing um, a phenomenal job managing most one of the most intense uh, uh, fisheries in, in the Great Lakes, of which Sam in the Classroom is a vital role. And to me, um, there are lessons in and out of this um, management regime that are they they that go from communication to predator prey dynamics to uh, involving people as resource and stewards in the ecosystem. Um, it's just an amazing uh, example. So was it needed? I hope to show you that. I hope you, you see that the ecosystem really needed a top predator. And Pacific salmon were the one. Has it been successful? Uh, absolutely. They've they've brought that. Uh, predator prey dynamic back, but is it is, is sustainable? Yeah, you know, I would say this is where you look at, we really need to change our expectations going back to the, it's not a put, grow, take. The more fish you put in, the more you get out. And really we don't have control over these ecosystems at the level that people think we do. In, in particular, as these food webs become more and more complex, when the, introduction, the in, in, introductions of invasive species and, and other things, we're going to have to have tools in our toolbox like Pacific salmon, like native species restoration and management to try to promote stability in the food web um, and manage them knowing that we don't have 100% control over how these ecosystems are functioning. Um, so with that, I, you know, I, I'm going to pause because I, I, Tracy, where am I at with time? And um, do you want to pause there for questions? Um, and I guess I can turn it back to you or I can uh, talk a little bit more, but um, you know, that might've been enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are fine on time. And currently I have answered the questions that have come in. Um, okay. They haven't necessarily been aimed at anything you need to answer. So um, it's up to you. Yeah, let, let, let me just go forward with a couple of lessons. Cause I've, I've I, you know, to me, I've, I've alluded to this idea that this can introducing food web, um, Dynamics and predator prey dynamics can be very complicated and but should 
can be part of the salmon in the classroom lesson plan in in addition to just rearing salmon. Um, one of the a couple of the analogies I really like to 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 use are um, this idea of the rivets theory, where basically you know if I take a rivet that holds the outer shell of an airplane out, will the plane crash? No, it won't. Well, what if I took out two, three, ten, and I just kept pulling rivets out? I might get to that last one where the plane falls apart midair and crashes to the bottom. The Great Lakes in the salmon program is very tied to this idea that to some extent, sea lamprey drove was that last rivet in the 1960s with it with a population crashed. And the introduction of non native species can both promote diversification among populations, but it can also limit it. And so, you know, how do you relate introducing Pacific salmon to invasive species and biodiversity? And this idea of using other analogies like the rivets there is, is a really good one. And if you're really interested in invasive species biology and these type of things, there's a book called Out of Eden, like the Garden of Eden. Phenomenal read on um, how to talk about invasive um, species management and really how important it is to our uh, ecosystems out of Eden, like the Garden of Eden. Um, another analogy that I like to use, and I, and I will oftentimes bring this in and, uh, um, you know, bring in an orange and talk about uh, an experiment that was done by a guy by the name of Jim Huffaker. And he used on, a, on an orange in the wild as it's growing on a tree, there's two little bugs that live on the orange. One of them is a prey and one of them is this T predator uh, um, that eats a six spotted uh, uh, prey mite. And what he did was he put a, a, some of them both on an orange and watch what happened in a few hours. The predator ate all the prey and then it starved to death and the experiment was over. But what was really interesting about this, if you ever read about his experiments, was he started adding more and more oranges. And he, and some of them would be connected by spring, by strings. Some had little tubes that only the, the prey could go through. Some had barriers that could only be jumped by the predators. And he was able to run an experiment that had oscillations between predator and prey that lasted months. Um, I can only imagine what this guy's laboratory looked like, but this idea that complexity actually promotes stability in an ecosystem. So you've got invasive uh, species on one end that could cause the last rivet of the ecosystem to fall in the, in the, in the community crash. It could cause increase in biodiversity. It might add stability or it, co it could cause more complexity that could add st to stability in the ecosystem. Just some basic principles to say, you know, the, how do you get at understanding complexity in an ecosystem relative to this food pyramid idea? Um, and with the Great Lakes, you know, we're going to continue to see more invasive species. And I would say, even though we have to manage salmon at lower levels today, they are as, as valuable in our ability to deal with these invasive species, if not more today as they were in the 1960s when we introduced Chinook salmon uh, to try to bring control to uh, um, alewife and rainbow smell populations. So that's all I have. I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of share perspective um, uh, on the salmon program in the Great Lakes. Thanks, Randy. So um, if you guys have questions, throw it in the Q&A and it'll pop up for me and I can publish them and, and ask um, Randy for you live. Um, but yeah, you, you spoke to a lot of points that we kind of hit on earlier in the day and then got into more details. And um, all the teachers will understand better what I said at the very beginning, right? So I am that weird hybrid that, you know, I have those biology degrees and oceanography degrees and then went for education and became like a filter between the scientists and teachers and package it up so you guys can understand it. And Randy is an excellent speaker. He's one of our best speakers. But can you imagine trying to not have a go between <laughs> between Randy's biology content and your students, right? So that's where you guys come in. We hope we can get to the point where we can have our biologists talk to you and give you data and and let you play with that data with your students and and you guys can be the filter from the scientists to your students and help them appreciate the ecosystem and want to be a part of it and to help to, you know, utilize that resource and conserve it and, you know, be part of the larger system. So that's where you guys come in big time because 
you know, we work in our little bubbles, especially right now, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, you feel like you're, you're, you know, talking to the wind sometimes. So it's great to have an outlet where we can get this to students and we can get it to teachers and have a larger impact with all the good work that our, you know, fisheries staff does all the time. So thank you for that. Yeah, and certainly, you know, I think um, diving into this for more of a technical side, but also showing how we've had to both communicate the complexity of this with, you know, involving stakeholders and just and even non fishers, not people that want to see healthy Gray Lakes, but still are wondering why why stock Pacific salmon. And, uh, you know, I, I try to allude to some of those in these dynamics. And um, yeah, it's one of the most exciting things to manage as a fisheries manager is salmon in the Great Lakes. It really is, but very difficult to communicate out because of the complexity. Yeah. It is, yeah, and um, you know, and we have so many dynamics coming down the pipe, like you said, you know, invasive carp on the horizon, and you know, all these other pieces that are already in play with invasive species. So, you know, that's kind of the future, right? How do you balance um, the impacts of those invasive species, and and you know, try to make those either be controlled, like we have with the sea lamprey, to some extent, um, or can you keep them out altogether? You know, what is the ecosystem going to look like if they do get here, and how are we going to have to manage a totally different system and you know so there's a lot of things on the horizon that you know the teachers your students are going to have a whole different world in college and a whole different workplace and a whole new set of problems and you know so a lot of our content and activities especially the ones I've written in the last few years are problem based you know set up scenarios and give the students background information and then try to solve the problem and you know I mentioned one to you guys the carp conundrum program that I've been doing live and you know I outline the carp species and what they you know their life histories and you know their size and where they are and how the invasion has gone and you know throw it to the students with a google map image of okay now fix the problem I don't care how you fix it fix it and defend it you know, and, um, you know, propose solutions because that's how we're going to get through a lot of this stuff in the future. So um, the more we can do that with all of this content and, you know, utilizing the awesome um, graphics and, and data from Randy and our other biologists, you know, I hope you guys can do that in your classrooms and turn this into something that uses real data and real world problems and, you know, get your students thinking. So. Yeah, and if I could also just add to that, um, the with Lake Huron after the Chinook crash in 2004 um, and those populations being at still at low levels, um, most people say, well, you know, there's I've heard that there's really no prey or bait fish left in the lakes and the mussels are are, um, are sucking up all those nutrients. We are, we have now have the biggest Atlantic, landlocked Atlantic salmon program in Lake Huron. So we started an expanding Atlantic salmon and we start, started, you know, I was in a track meet in 1989 in high school, was the last year that we stocked Chinook sal or coho salmon in Lake Huron. I've now re-instituted -instit coho salmon stocking for the first time since 1989. So then people say, wait, there's no, there's no prey left, but you're now introducing Atlantic salmon from the Atlantic Ocean, Chinook, coho, steelhead, brown trout, lake trout, you know, what are you doing? And it's this idea, having a diverse predator and prey community. So you're right, Tracy, laying out problems and then seeing what solutions um, students come up with. I mean, there is no end of challenges. And again, it gets these basic biological principles that um, it'd be nice to be able to rewind time and go back to a restored ecosystem with lake trout dominated and um, you know the, all those native corgonids, but we'll never get some of those species back. And so how do we deal with these changing systems and the problems just keep coming, both evasive carbs, but also water quality. I mean, I, the nutrients is as difficult as anything. You know, it's not only um, are we seeing a lack of nutrients in production in the offshore, but all these nutrients are being focused in nearshore, causing huge problems with cladophora and beaches that have algae growing on them. And, and you know, talk about those dynamics. It's just, uh, yeah, no shortage of problems. Yeah. So we had one question come in um, and you can answer it and I can also answer it. So um, has the SIC program inspired students in the past years to work for the DNR? Have you noticed this? Absolutely. I mean, I've had um, and I, let me also say we for the first time we're developing a new management plan for Perch and Walleye in Saginaw Bay. 
we got a work group together and we have a student, a high school student sitting on a advisory committee to develop a management plan for Saginaw Bay, which some could argue is one of the top fisheries in the state. A high school student who was involved in things like Sam in the classroom was involved in at a high level as a, as a high school student, and we want to hear their perspective. So um, they're not even working in the profession now, and they're giving us input. So absolutely, I think the connections both to employment and also to just being connected to the management. Um, is, this is the venue. This is like the way the door opens uh, programs like Sam in the classroom. Yeah, and I've seen it within the program from two different directions. So we have several Sam in the classroom teachers that used to be fisheries biologists <laughs> in like a former life, right? Yep. And so, you know, you're seeing it on that end where they're so inspired by the education side of it, they go that way. And then also with the students, we had um, one good example is the high school in Cadillac had a student in the program, wasn't there. He encouraged the school to apply because, you know, he was not, uh, you know, he was a minor and he did all the fundraising. He did all the equipment procurement. He did all the installation. He did every single thing for the fish the entire year, all himself. He planned the release day as a sophomore wow. in high school. And, you know, and he did this for three years and graduated and has helped keep the program going. And they're actually starting back up this year after a gap year. And, you know, he's now at school in Lake Superior State, but he's one of those kids. He's like on a different, <laughs> he's a coalition for this and this work group. And, you know, he's like a freshman in college, but he's, you know, doing really good work and he's not even into the field yet. So it's, it's nice to be able to inspire those students and get them connected because I was that student, you know, and I was that kid in high school that's like, I like fish. And my counselor's like, eh, I don't know. And I'm like, but I like fish. Where do I go for fish? And he's like, I don't know. You have a scholarship to U of M. Go there. And so I did. And I didn't like it. And I transferred 5,000 miles away to get a degree I could have gone to Lake Superior State for. You know, so the more we can connect these students to resources and career opportunities and what's out there and what the future is going to look like, I think the better off we are, you know, not only for our resources and the recreational use, but also for, you know, the management in the future. So I think it's pretty cool. And that was the only question we got. We're hitting the end of the day. They're toast. No worries. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Randy. Have a good weekend. I really appreciate it. Thanks again, Tracy and everyone. Mm -hmm.